everyone. Christ is risen. I'm Sister Vasa, and welcome to a special episode of Saturday Morning Live with Sister Vasa. This episode is special, my friends. First of all, because it's not really live, and also because we have a special guest whom I'll be interviewing. And in just a moment, first I'll tell you about him and then show you this fascinating video. Our guest is, wait for it, Abbot Trifon of internet fame. He is a popular blogger and podcaster on Ancient Faith Radio. He has uh, the, his podcast and blog is called The Morning Offering. You can check that out on Ancient Faith Radio. And Abbot Trifon has been a monk for almost 40 years. He is a convert to orthodoxy, raised a Lutheran. His father was a golf pro and his mother an organist and music teacher. But in his young adult years, uh, Abbot Trifon became a psychotherapist and he was somehow at that same time, slipping away from his Christian roots, found himself holding atheistic views, as he himself writes. But he had this longing in his heart that led him to search and you know, investigate ancient Christianity. And that led him eventually to embrace orthodoxy. Today, Abbot Trifon is the abbot of a monastery on Vashon Island in Washington state. It's a very secluded monastery, as far as I understand. The Brotherhood, under Father Abbot Trifon's leadership, is very into organic uh, gardening. Uh, they produce heirloom organic vegetables, as I've read, but they uh, support themselves by selling gourmet coffee. It's a line of gourmet coffee uh, called Monastery Blend. I've tried this coffee and it's excellent. So you can go to the website, I'll provide the link right here, of the Brotherhood and order their coffee to support them. So we'll be talking to Father Abbot Trifon, uh, mostly, I hope, about how his experience as a psychotherapist, psychotherapist informs his pastoral uh, activities within the Orthodox Church today. Also, how his experience of having slipped away from his Christian roots into atheism and then returning, how that informs his pastoral uh, ministry, and all sorts of other interesting things. We'll see what his take is on the most common problems and issues people have and with which they might come to him in our today. Hello, Father Abbot Srifon. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Thank you for agreeing to come on to our little show. And I have to thank you, first of all, for being a support personally to me for these years. I have to tell the viewers, before I let Father Srifon say a few words, uh, that uh, I've never crossed paths with Father Srifon, uh, you know, met him in the same physical space. So um, I'm looking forward to someday meeting him in person, but this is the best we can do for now. And I'll get right into the interview, Father Trifon. Uh, tell me, first of all, has your experience as a psychotherapist influenced and somehow, I would say, informed and helped your pastoral ministry as a priest and abbot? I think it has. Uh, first of all, I will say that I am a recovering psychologist. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I was I took a second look at my former career was that I was feeling more and more that many of my colleagues were, were more interested in insurance coverage than they were in the patients. And, uh, and that troubled me. And I also was troubled by the fact that we had to, uh, that in our therapy, we had to give people labels because of the insurance. You know, if you're gonna have insurance coverage, then you need to be proving that, that well, this person is 
um, you know, mentally ill and give them a label, but I felt that that was counterproductive. And so I think in many ways, I'm a better therapist now than I was then, because now I have uh, the, the therapy of the Orthodox Church, uh, which I use in my uh, interactions with people who are going through difficult times. Right. So could you, I suppose these difficult times uh, vary, of course, from person to person. But would you, as a pastor of already so many years of experience, if you had to, if you had three seconds to say, what would be the most common sort of illness, a spiritual illness with which people come to you today, perhaps in the last few years? I probably would say despair. despair. A lot of people suffer from despair. Uh, which sometimes has its roots in a low self-image, a lot of guilt. Um, and I try to help them out of that. If we don't really learn to love ourselves and to respect ourselves, um, then uh, the spiritual life can be a, a bigger struggle than it should be. So I think people need to, to be told clearly that it is all right to feel good about yourself. You know, this idea that it is somehow if we're going to be truly repentant, that we have to constantly be thinking of ourselves as the worst person out there. When St. Paul said that he was the worst of sinners, well, we can say that, but we don't have to say it in, in a way that is denigrating, self-denigrating. Right. So what would, I don't know if there's a simple answer to this, but... I think that, you know, people are afraid to fall into pride. Our tradition seems to talk a lot about humility and pride as being the number one sin and humility and a certain understanding of obedience. I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes that's sort of a distortion of what that is. And there's a sort of a, you know, an unwillingness sometimes. Well, I... I find that in my own life, I went through a sort of false understanding of obedience, um, but a certain uh, reluctance to take responsibility. And so there, it's sometimes easier, perhaps, to say, well, I'm just a miserable sinner. I can never grow, because that would mean pride if I thought that I'm growing, that I have learned, and that I have valuable experience. You know, there's a, when you tell people to love themselves, they're like, oh, is that some kind of, you know, psycho babble? That's like self-help kind of, you know, some, so um, my question would be, how do you help people to love themselves in the right way? And on the basis of Orthodox faith? Well, I would have to say this, God loves us. And I remember many years ago, a, a man telling me that of his five sons, that one of them had problems. He wasn't very good looking. He, he was uh, terrible in sports. He had a learning disability. He had all of these marks against him, where his brothers, his four brothers were all smart and good athletes and handsome and, and you know, great students. And the dad told me that, you know, he said, of all my sons, it's that fifth one that I believe needs my love the most. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way it is with God, that we, God loves us and we are his, a child, his children by adoption. And that in itself says a lot. It's sort of like uh, when people struggle with wondering if God even exists because they don't feel his presence. It's like the good dad who, um, the mom is on the other side of the room and holding her little toddler up by his hands, uh, ready to get the toddler to make his first steps on his own. And between the toddler, the mom, and the dad, there's this space in between. And the toddler is afraid. But if, if the mother doesn't let go of the toddler and let him take those first steps towards his father, who's got his hands out reaching, 
um, then the toddler will never truly become independent. He'll never learn how to walk on his own. And I think sometimes when God seems absent, that that's what, what God is doing as a loving father to us. He's giving us that opportunity to stand on our own two feet and reach out and walk towards him. And it's, that is the beginning of, of, of the healing of the inner soul of the, of, of the person, is when we're taking those steps uh, towards God with confidence that God truly loves us and that his arms are outstretched to receive us. Right, thank you so much for that. The way I understand that uh, partly is that it's, I guess it's hard to accept God's love and to really believe that he could love someone like me, right? For a person that's without God, they, behind that thought, behind that conviction uh, that you know, God couldn't love someone like me. It's like, well, I can accept that he exists, but it's really a stretch to think that he'd have time or the willingness to really pay attention to me. It shows that that lack of self-love is not allowing me to accept God. You know, somehow there's a connection between self-love and being open to God's love. So the, the way I understand that is that that's why we have this strange like kind of negotiation in the Our Father that the Lord teaches us to say, you know, like forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as if, as if he's not gonna forgive if we don't, but the whole thing is that it's impossible for us to accept his forgiveness if we're not self-forgiving and others forgiving, right? Exactly. So I wonder if that would be an insight, you know, that what I have referred to as psychobabble Actually, behind it, there are some truths, you know, that, that in a, when you shed the light of our faith on them, that do make a lot of sense. You know, but if you, if you speak, do you find that you speak and write sometimes with the language of modern day psychology? Is your, do you find that the words, you know, we do have some words in our church tradition that might be you know, hard for people who are having a hard time with self-acceptance and self-love to swallow. You know, with I'm a worthless kind of dog, or I know these things in Slavonic, but some of it's very extreme. You know, so do you find that a language that is updated in the sense of, I mean, this is not a rhetorical question, it's actually a question, you know? Would it be a loss? To Orthodox tradition, you know, I mean, it's already happening, of course, because we're living human beings in the 21st century. Our language is different. We don't speak like a Byzantine hymn, right? But maybe you could share some thoughts on what I just said about using language that people recognize as also used both in psychotherapy and in popular, say, self-help 12-step programs that are, can be very helpful to people, right? Why don't you comment, if you could, Father, on that? Well, I would say this. First of all, I want to clarify that I'm not a, uh, a theologian like yourself. Uh, I am a simple monk uh, who uh, <clears throat> at some point felt that God was pressing on my heart uh, a desire to reach out with orthodoxy. The problem with a lot of the material that is out there is that it is, uh, it is of a theological nature that is deep. Now, I have read everything I can find on orthodoxy since my big first, in fact, when I was first becoming orthodox, there was hardly anything in English. Uh -huh. And now I have, we have three libraries here filled with books and they're all in English and it's exciting but that said the average individual and I hear about this from people all the time people that grew up in the church were born and raised in the church but they have very little understanding of orthodox theology you don't say. I remember once I was shocked I was at a 
uh, at a pastoral conference and, and I was lecturing and I mentioned the word noose. And there was a senior priest that raised his hand in the questions and answers and he says, what's the noose? And I'm thinking, gee, you know, even some priests don't understand some of those theological uh, depths of orthodoxy. But I decided that I was going to write in a simple way of uh, taking profound teachings of the Orthodox Church and, and then in a concise way, um, direct my thoughts to those teachings uh, in a way that was palatable for the average person. So I hear from people like uh, a doctor who told me that she listens to my podcasts on her way to the hospital every morning. And they're only three or four minutes long. And, and so I really kind of pack a lot of stuff into those. But I really believe that if we don't learn the depths of our orthodox that we are uh, that we are in danger of having a form of Christianity for ourselves that is not authentically orthodox. When I was a growing up Lutheran, there was a famous Lutheran theologian, Martin Marty. And Martin Marty once said that if Lutheran pastors didn't start teaching Lutheran theology to their people, that they would have a whole generation of parishioners who were Calvinists because the, the television evangelists of the time were mostly Calvinists. So people, the average person out there was getting their theology from television. And I remember a while back, I don't remember who the priest was, but there was some priest that I think online that said that it's not enough for parishes to have Sunday schools for the children. During the same time, there should be um, advanced classes in orthodoxy made available to the parents and to the elders of the parish so that people are actually getting a chance to go into the faith in the deep way that, that gives them the, the tools and the strength, the personal strength to live in a life in a society that is gone in many ways, bonkers, and certainly secular. Right. Well, I find that what you do, Father, is so valuable specifically, apart from other reasons, that you do it on a daily basis. Because what you refer to as just having Sunday school, uh, people, for practical reasons also, might only make it to church on Sundays. For so many lay people, it's just a Sunday thing. And you give them something every day, really, really that helps put the Sunday worship into practical use in that in the so-called real world, you know, that I grew up in as a cradle Orthodox, right? Very much in my, our beautiful Russian Orthodox sort of ghetto back in the Cold War years when, you know, Rokor was very isolated. And we only had friends who were Russian and old calendar. And my parents would even sort of frown on us forming friendships with Americans. <laughs> it was like, we sort of were, you know, we went to public school and, uh, you know, in Nyack, New York, but we really were friends with the Russian kids. We went to Russian camp and all of this. So what am I getting at? Um, I'm getting at that, you know, in that beautiful world, uh, I was blessed to have parents that truly had faith and not just the cultural thing, the Russia thing, you know, but I do think that there is this, when I look at, say, younger people losing interest, you know, at that age in their teens, sometimes when they begin to have their own children, they come back, right? but losing interest in the whole church thing, because I think that sometimes having grown up also in a beautiful tradition, it is just a Sunday thing, or it's about something that's, you know, that it's about something secondary. So 
I think that it's it's hard for people to see what that very Byzantine, you know, the bells and smells and the long beards and what it really has to do with the real world, right? Uh, especially if we don't talk about or we don't articulate in the language of today's kinds of issues, today's kinds of fears. Anyway, so I just wanted to say that it's very much appreciated your, and for the viewers, I'll repeat that Father Trifon's daily uh, morning offering is available on Ancient Faith Radio. So check it out if you haven't yet. All right, Father, so another question to you. In connection with that, my little uh, tirade just now, I want to ask you the question whether, you know, you as a monastic and as one who lives in a monastic community, because I don't, so I'm sort of in between, even though God led me to this strange space, but I sort of have made out of it that which I can to realize my monastic calling. But anyway, you do live in a monastic community, and I want to ask, does your online ministry, which is probably mostly to lay people, right, um, does it disrupt your monastery life, disrupt in quotes, right, uh, and if so, does it disrupt it in a good way or a bad way? And I, I say I, I formulated the question that way because I think that there could be a positive disruption of a certain isolationism of monasticism, um, and that there, I see it as a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship between monastics and lay people. All right. So, what do you say to those questions? Well, it's interesting. When we first came to Vashon Island, uh, one of the first things that I noticed about this community, we have about 11,000 people that live uh, on an island that's about the size of Manhattan, New York. So it's a large island, uh, 17 miles long, seven and a half miles wide at the widest. It's 87% undeveloped forest. We also have the largest per capita um, uh, Artists and writers uh, in the state of Washington live on this island. So it's a very cultured island. We even have our own opera company. And, uh, and, and that given, we also have very few churches. And the churches that are on this island, they're all the main blind denominations. But they are all uh, small in, in attendance. So the majority of the people on this island, probably 98% of the people on this island are not religiously bound to any kind of religion or institution. They're, they're devoid of all that. Um, I have even when I've spoken at our high school, I've had, um, I've had teachers tell me that you're going to have to explain in detail what you are about because most of our students won't even know who this is. Really? They won't even know. Uh, the New York Times a number of years of, 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 during the last presidential election uh, said of Seattle that Seattle has the most self-declared atheists in, this, in the country. And uh, so we are impacted by all of that. If there's any religion at all, uh, in this region, it would be uh, nihilism, I would believe, that there's really no hope, you know, we just, whatever we can make financially, uh, whatever lifestyle and, and uh, music we listen to, that's really all that's there. But it isn't enough. Um, about 17 years ago, in my desire, we've been on this island for about 32 years, and about 17 years ago, in my desire to reach out to the greater community uh, during times of stress or need or, or loss, I, uh, I offered to be the chaplain uh, for our sheriff's department and our fire department. So I've been doing that for a long time. One of the benefits is I have a great badge that I can put on, on my belt, <laughs> a great big badge, which really causes confusion when I'm out and about and people look at the cross and they look at the badge. I've even had people ask me if I'm the sheriff. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Have you become the sheriff? Um, what does it say on your badge? 
What is it's, it? It's, it's, a, um, it's the uh, King County uh, uh, Sheriff's Department chaplain with a cross in the middle. Well, about your, okay, this activity, that's a specific thing, but it's not the online ministry, you know, because your online ministry probably gets you invitations to speak somewhere, brings you out of your monastery, correct? I know that you speak to large crowds of students and stuff like that. Uh, students, I also travel a lot. I've been uh, to the East Coast a number of times speaking in, in parishes there. Uh, I'm going to be in Calgary, Alberta uh, coming up. and I'm going to be in Mississippi. Uh, so I do a lot of traveling like that. Recently, I was in Spokane, Washington at Whitworth University uh, speaking. Uh, those are all, uh, those all really come out of my online ministry. That's where people have heard about me. To my question, would that be disruptive for your monastery life, or is it helpful? Well, I think it's helpful in the sense that it's put us on the map, and so we, we get a lot of people that donate uh, financially to the monastery uh, because maybe they're grateful for my ministry, and so they want to show their support by giving to the monastery, which is a great help to us. Our coffee company that we have and our and we also make homemade uh, soaps uh, that helps a lot, but it's not enough. So we really depend on donations of our friends and supporters. But I, regarding my own ministry, um, I do spend at least forty five minutes minimum every day writing a blog article. And then my podcasts, I usually, uh, get up around two in the morning to do my podcast because, uh, and that's Monday through Friday. The blog is seven days a week, and then the podcast is Monday through Fridays. Oh, and I do that in the early hours for two reasons. One, my radio voice is better at that early hour, <laughs> my national public radio voice. All right, your Walter Cronkite voice. Yes, but the other thing that is that's helpful for this is that it's a time when I don't have telephone calls coming in and, and I, it's just me and my laptop and my microphone in my cell. Uh, right now I am in my, uh, in my study. Um, but it doesn't impact what I do in ministry doesn't impact the, the community in a negative way. As I said, we get donations which helps a lot but and then when I do travel uh you know it's 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 spread out through the years so I'm not it's not like I'm gone for a, long, a lengthy period of time right um you know it, but you know what else it does for me it, it it is a discipline that I have put upon myself and I've been doing this for many many years uh so it's a benefit to me spiritually so sometimes when I'm writing articles and I'm thinking, wow, I, I need to pay attention to this. I also post my articles on uh, Facebook because that goes into a whole other realm. So the Abbott Trefon Facebook page uh, goes a long ways. And then the morning offering blog. Right, right. Yes, I have seen those, uh, the Facebook page as well. Um, so about the role of, say the monastic uh, yeah I'm, I'm fascinated by this this uh this phenomenon i would say of a monastic presence online that's because it's a new space what is the internet it's there isn't the physical space of a church and and community building if i could put it that way is happening uh, as it never has before divorced from physical space, and one could provocatively say outside of sacramental space, because sacraments involve physical space, not being anonymous, being face-to-face, -face, right? It's very personal. In the Orthodox tradition, your name is named when you receive Holy Communion. The priest names you when, you're, when he's absolving you at confession. These, these are very, it is, we confess, we we do, we don't hide between, you know, behind our profession of the faith. So there are elements 
in the community building that's happening online that might signalize, you know, very fundamental changes about how the church develops, how the church works. And I think that it is a time when it's un, uh, unchartered territory. So you might, it's not even really clear what you're, it's not an official ministry. You're not ordained to be an online missionary. You understand what I'm saying? It's, I do. It's, it's a ministry, it's a vocation that has sprung up uh, just, I think, by the will of God because it's, it's happening and it's, it's not something we made up. You know, it's just one of the one of the reasons why I have been a supporter of yours all these years is because what you do needs to be done. And for those who would criticize a nun for not living in a monastic community, but doing what you're doing, they, they're missing the mark. You know, one of the one of the beautiful things about Orthodox monasticism is that unlike, say, the Roman Catholic Church, where they have religious orders, you know, the Capuchins do one thing, they're friars, and then there's Benedictines who are more contemplatives, and, and the Camaldolese and the, the Trappists. Um, but within Orthodoxy, our we all belong, you and I belong to the same monastic order. And we dress the part. And, and, and so everyone in the, in the Orthodox community, at least, knows us when they see who we are in monastic garb. They know that that's what this is. But, it's, but the fact that we are both out in the online doing a ministry that goes all over the world, um, you know, Patriarch Kirill many years ago told his bishops that if they don't use, if the church doesn't use this online media, only the devil will use it. All right. That's like if, if all, if, what's the thing that the rednecks put on their t-shirts? Uh, if criminals, wait, if only criminals have, wait, if you ban guns, only criminals will have guns or something like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that reminds me of that. Well, yeah, the, the Russian church does a great job, I think, in trying to be up to speed with just, well, I think because it's, it's a very powerful church, has some money to, does remarkable things about trying to keep it, its eyes open and to utilize, uh, you know, what is available as far as social media. Plenty of, you know, priests on Instagram, I only recently got onto Instagram, you know, it's a whole new thing. I, do you do Instagram? No, I'm afraid of it. <laughs> oh, listen, you know, I, I resisted uh, for many years, right? But now it's really the thing. You, you'd you be huge there. I mean, it's, it's about, I have to say that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a female thing. Um, and you're not supposed to call yourself a woman if you're a nun, but, you know, I don't know if it's obvious, but that I am a female. and. The exposure, I have to say, is sometimes very tough. It doesn't matter if they're saying good things or bad things about you, you know, but this constant evaluation, I mean, everything you put out there gets a certain number of likes, gets a certain number of dislikes. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a burden to have to, and it's immediate feedback. I'm not, my beloved viewers, I'm not complaining about you, Zillions. Um, but it's just a yes, thing. the zillions. Uh, turn that mug around, Father. He says he's one of the zillions. Uh, thank you, thank you for having that mug. All right, no, turn it around. Show us that's my mug is on that mug. <laughs> yes, your mug is on the mug, and you're holding an ancient faith radio mug, and yeah. and uh, and I'm holding your mug, and I'm drinking <laughs> our coffee. How oh. bizarre is all that? <laughs> there are so many layers, Father, to this situation, many layers. Uh, yeah, so it, this has been a really delightful conversation, Father Trifon. Everybody, please 
uh, zillions, uh, go to the Brotherhood's website. I have provided and will provide also here the link where you can get the really tasty coffee uh, called Monastery Blend. And before we finish, Father Trifon, uh, perhaps a final question. Uh, we do have a divisive political climate today. It's not a secret to anyone. It affects the uh, awkward situations at the Thanksgiving Day, uh, you know, dinner table. <laughs> Between families, it causes certain difficulties also to talk about things. I think also because of the kind of strong opinions that people also anonymously can voice online or sort of hide behind the anonymity. Even if they're not anonymous, they're, you're, not, you're not benefiting from the subtle, like the smile, the, the levity, you know, of being together, right? And you're just getting pure opinion. So I think that, uh, of course, the internet age contributes to a very polarizing climate also in the church where, you know, when you look at ancient texts, I'm sorry to make my own, you know, little speech here long, but I'm, I'm doing this church father's course on my Patreon podcast. And uh, the texts that have been received into tradition you know, sometimes aren't exactly completely, especially when you go earlier into church history, some of them are entirely orthodox, but the fathers would take what was useful from those texts without feeling contaminated by some of the not orthodox opinions, like in the Shepherd of Hermas, which there's some stuff that's way out there, but it's been an important text for the ancient fathers. And what I want to say is that the polarization or the which we have in our politics, in popular culture, that you can, one thing if you disagree with, right? Or one thing that's been pronounced just by the self-proclaimed, of you know, uh, sometimes when I wanna say self-proclaimed, I'm not saying hierarchs, uh, experts on orthodoxy, um, you know, it's like you're dead in the water. And in the politics also, somebody says one thing people disagree with and they're like destroyed. So there's not a possibility of learning. And it makes for, I think, an inability to really integrate, you know, to have our faith really enlighten everything. It, it makes it irrelevant because it's, it's not able to deal with certain issues that weren't dealt with before, right? So, and inevitably there will be if one even attempts to address certain issues, and I don't want to get into certain, I'm not even going to name them right now, okay? I don't want to get into them, but I'm pointing out the problematic way in which we can really, you know, stone to death, but verbally, one another, especially those of us who have to, who for the reasons that God only knows, has placed to be exposed, you know? And so our in it, we just, the same kind of divisive politics in our political, you know, in the larger society are dividing yeah. us the church. And I just think that that's a big tragedy because in our church, if we could get to our little Rokor church that a lot of my viewers don't even really know about, we're not really, you know, that, I go around to different Orthodox parishes and um, we're very small, you know, in the Orthodox world. But I wanna say that in our church even, we can easily, you know, we forget that being so small, wouldn't it be good if we could stick together? Aren't there very few of us that are voices online? Do we have to be, you know, in the, just like the right and the left, they don't even talk to each other anymore. They go to their, own the left will go to msnbc to get its news the right will go to Fo just to simplify it you know to fox news um and you don't uh, you don't learn uh but as far as the church goes i want to just say i will get to a question for you through all of this um and I, i'm not just talking about myself but you might know that i've gone through something related to this um i feel like uh, 
there are perils in because of political divisiveness for complicated reasons that the internet you know is a polarizing space if if we don't aesthetically develop, develop strategies you know to avoid divisiveness um i think that there are perils to, to a certain kind of martyrdom to being out there because you're you've got to be like your hands outstretched on the cross and people will take their wipes at you you know and so i want to ask um have you you know because you talk to a lot of people and you get a lot of questions from people are could you share some you know some just some wisdom about uh, how do we navigate this divisive political climate without letting it uh, corrupt our own you know our openness to god's voice to one another how do we how do we deal with that divisiveness it's a very broad question but you know even amongst relatives you know i might say with my dad you know disagree with certain politics political issues uh but we have found a way really to to just not you know not make that important in our in our relationship um but it has divided people so anyway let me let you talk about this a little bit how would you help people deal with divisiveness you know say also in church political issues where people all get on the wagon and you know start discussing certain things over which they have no control about church politics all this stuff like what would you say to this kind of uh, situation well first of all um well, when i was in high school and college i was on the debate team and one of the things that debate taught me is that you don't have to be right to win a debate. You have to be good, but you don't have to be right. Okay. And uh and and I have a couple friends that are my age. Uh one is an atheist and the other one is a Lutheran. And uh both of them hold to views on some in some areas that differ from mine. And, and uh, in both those cases, uh, there have been times when they've been attempt, they've attempted to argue their, their point with me. Um, one of the funny things that I did uh, about a month ago, uh, I went to our farmer's market on the island and there's these two young um, Mormon missionaries, very friendly and they're going from booth to booth and talking to people and so on. And I went up to them one day and I said, see those Jehovah's Witnesses with their rack over there? I said, I'll tell you what, if you go over and challenge them to a public debate, I'll be the moderator. <laughs> you didn't. And, and I said, and we could film it and it will go viral. And I mean, you know, we've all, at least in this country, we've all suffered with having Mormon elders and Jehovah's Witnesses come to our homes. Yes. Well, neither of them is correct in their theological views. Right. But if you're not good at defending your theological stands of the Orthodox Church, they're going to win. Doesn't mean they're right, they're going to win. Right. And I think it's the same thing with a political scene out there. You know, I, when I do look at the news, and it's only once a week, I'll allow myself, and I'll, and I'll look at different v news media, from Fox to CNN uh, to international, you know, British news and Russian news. And I get all of that in there. It's all churning in my head. And some of it I agree with, some I disagree with. But I wanna know out of respect for my neighbors, I wanna know what they think. If I'm only listening to one source for my news, then I am, I am not allowing myself to have a greater vision of what people are thinking out there. Right. And, and sometimes the right is right, and sometimes the left is right on different things. Right. But we are so polarized that 
we cannot even accept the possibility that they could be right on anything. Right. And so I, I, for myself, I try to get my, uh, my news from various sources. And it's the same way in the Orthodox Church. We have dogmas that we are bound to accept as, as dogmas of the church. But there are other teachings of the church that are not of the realm of dogma. And, and, and so there's room to debate these. And there's room to, uh, to have interactions among our theologians and our pastors. And our, you know, this is the value that we have in the Orthodox world. It's not like, it's all not just black and white. You know, that's one of the things that I have admired about you and the suffering that you've gone through at different times uh, in your own ministry. Um, is that there are some individuals that can't see the truth in what I've just said. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Father Tarifan. It's wonderful. And again, thank you uh, always for being so supportive. I hope that we do also physically cross paths. Uh, so I do too. Soon. I will be on the West Coast. It's not that close to you, but maybe I could think of some way or we could work. Well, you know, one of my friends, Father Moses Berry, uh, he's another individual that I really respect and I like what he does online. And, and so uh, we've actually managed, he had me as a guest uh, the, uh, at the, uh, I guess it was a year ago at the um, uh, St. Moses, the Black Conference. And, but it gave Father Moses and I a chance to speak together at the same conference. And I would love it if someday that God would grace us to be able to do the same, to speak at the same place oh, yeah. together and, and then be able to sit back and then we'll debate who makes the best coffee. <laughs> I think that's the question on everyone's mind. <laughs> that's the burning question. Uh, Everybody, listen, so if, if somebody's watching this over there on the west coast of the U.S. of A, I know that's a large area, but I will be in San Diego. Uh, I will be first in Phoenix, Arizona with a talk at a church there, then in San Diego, California. Maybe you have a parish, any beloved viewer watching us today, and you're on the west coast. Maybe I could quite easily, more easily than from Vienna, Austria, uh, fly over or be driven over to your parish. And maybe you'd like to organize uh, a talk also with Father Trifon, um, you know, and with myself. That would be an interesting event, right? It would. So if you're listening and you're interested, uh, write to uh, my assistant at co coffee with Sister Vasa at gmail.com. Is that right? <laughs> my assistant is sitting here very patiently texting and uh <laughs> i would like to at least say hello before we're done all right my assistant Roel yes. is here today you want to say hi to father trifon hello <laughs> hello he's hello. taken up <laughs> i wish i had an assistant he told i have two assistants father and a third one does my bookkeeping so that says about me that i am lazy but um he wants know that you have your priorities yeah, I, I turned I turned over all the uh, all of that stuff to Father Paul years ago because we would be poor in the poorhouse if it was left up to me. Right. Well, that's true about me as well. But I have my beloved supporters that really it's completely self-supporting the and crowdfunded. You know this thing that. Well, I you have those zillions out there. Yes, I, I do it full time, and uh, it's very gratifying and. You know, it's an honor, of course, to be doing it. So Rasul actually, does, he told me today that he, he might be quitting. So it's always, uh, these kids work for me for a time and then they move on. And so you have to recreate the team, you know, that's different. Well, in a monastery, sometimes it's like that too. There's the revolving door. I lived in a monastery for years and that was quite painful to see people sometimes go, right? Yeah. It happens. All right. Uh, All right. Well, God bless you and it was a joy. Yes. Same here. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Mm -hmm.